All right, we're live at New Covenant University tonight. We are, or whenever you're watching this, we're going to be we're going to be teaching on uh, some New Covenant principles. Let me just loosen this up so I can raise that up just a little bit. There we go. That's a much better shot right there. Thank you so much. Much better shot. Okay, and I've got a class of people here. A cla- uh, I didn't say classless. A classy <laughs> group of a classy group of people here. And so we're talking about finances tonight, and we're talking about my book. Uh, your textbook for this class is Money Matters. Now, tell me the name of this class again. The number. Principles of Biblical Economics. Is we, do we have a number? ECO 120. It's already on the... ECO 120. It's already on the, uh, mm-hmm. it's already on the uh, video. Okay, very good. Well, we're glad you're here. I'm Dr. Paul Kreitz. We're doing this class live from St. Augustine, Florida. We're glad to have everybody here with us. And the first part of this teaching, if you're a minister or you're a pastor... Uh, traveling minister, you're going to really enjoy this because the first part of this financial uh, teaching tonight um, is regarding leaders, uh, talking to leaders about finances. And then the next part will be 10 keys to financial empowerment. So get a sheet of paper, or in our case here, you have a small outline for the first section that we're going to cover. And we're going to talk about that um, decisions create destiny, decisions decide destiny. Um, Regarding your finances, you know, what you know is based upon who you know. And your present is your future until you learn something new. Your past decisions have created your present realities. So whatever you've done in the past has brought you to where you're at in the present. So you were not created to live in yesterday and tomorrow at the same time. You've got to decide if you want to live in past memories or a future destiny. Now, um, let me see the outline that uh, you have real quick, Robert. Just let me see that just for one second so I know where to go with this. Okay. All right. I am going to cover that. Okay. Okay. Um, take a sheet of paper and draw a line down the middle. On one side, I want you to put the person of Jesus. And on the other side, I want you to put the principles of Jesus. And what we want to talk about when it comes to prosperity is for you to have an understanding of the principles of Jesus. Because everybody understands the person of Jesus. The church you went to Sunday talks about the person of Jesus. But we want to talk about the principles. On the purpose of Jesus is Jesus came to talk to us how to get to heaven. How to get to heaven. But the principles of Jesus teach us how to live here on earth. How to live here on earth. Which is going to bring in your finances. You're going, someone says, well, the, the streets are made of gold and, uh, you know, I've got a big mansion over there. That's the person of Jesus. He's all about heaven. But you're still living on earth, so we're going to have to teach you the principles of Jesus. The, the person of Jesus brings you your peace. The principle of Jesus brings you your prosperity. The person of Jesus brings you your peace. The, the uh, principles of Jesus bring your prosperity. Now, I taught this in great detail at uh, my Wisdom Center Church yesterday. So I'm just giving you a little snippet here tonight. Uh, The person of Jesus talks about reigning in the future. You know, what it's going to be like to reign in the new heavens and all that. But the principles of Jesus talk about us ruling in the present, being the head, not the tail. Uh, Leading, leading, walking in the blessing. The person of Jesus talks to us how to enter into his presence. How to enter his presence. We come to church, it's all about Jesus. How do we worship? How do we enter into his presence? But his principles teach us how to operate in protocol. There's a certain way you do certain things, and that's what the principles of Jesus teach us. Now, I want to make this statement, and it's in my book, which is your textbook, Money Matters. Money Matters, it's the textbook, and you can get that at, uh, here in the United States, you can get that at paulkreitz.com. Or if you're uh, in a program, you can get that um, through our uh, university there in the Bahamas. And so I want to make a statement to you that money is more important than any human will tell you. Mm -hmm. Money is more important than any human will explain to you. Ecclesiastes 10.19 says, 
A feast is made for laughter, and wine makes one merry. But money answers everything. Class, let's all say money. Money. Money, money answers everything. Mm-hmm. Now, it's very interesting that you understand that money does follow a belief system. Money follows a philosophy. And so the correct philosophy regarding financial prosperity, I have some questions to ask you. Number one, most people say, do I qualify for financial prosperity? I've even had people ask me, is it God's will for me to prosper? And will I fall away from God if I become prosperous? No more than, you know, people drown every year doesn't stop me from drinking water. Number four, the big question is who taught you about money and did they have any? Who taught you about money and did they have any? So you need money to achieve anything significant. You want to write that down. You need money to achieve anything significant. You're going to need money to send missionaries around the world. You're going to need money to broadcast the gospel. You're watching me in a foreign country right now. Hello, Dr. Ford over in the Bahamas. You're watching me in a foreign country That doesn't happen because I spoke in tongues. That happens because we have equipment. We we've purchased uh, a camera here, and we have the and we have a place where we're broadcasting this this teaching from. So money, if you're going to achieve anything significant, you're going to need money. Uh, Money is simply the reward system of Earth. Money is simply the reward system of Earth. Money is anything that has value that can be traded for something of value. Now, the question is, what is prosperity? And the answer of prosperity is simply this. Prosperity is having enough divine provision to complete a divine assignment on earth. That is the definition of prosperity. Prosperity does not mean many cars, many houses, jets. It is simply having enough divine provision to complete a divine assignment on earth. There's a big difference between your provision and your prosperity. Your provision, Jesus said, I'll meet your needs. Mm -hmm. Consider the lilies of the field. Consider the birds of the air. They don't toil, spin. They don't don't sow or reap. So their provision, and he says, how much more important are you than them? So Jesus is going to meet your needs, but you have desires. And your desires are where the prosperity comes in. You have a desire to do something significant for God. Now, um, regarding these notes that you have, I think I'm going to pause. I'm going to just have you flip over your sheet, and I want you to take some other notes. I want to move because of the time, and I want to give you 10 keys to financial empowerment. There are no other uh, notes on that, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of a beginning, and then I'm going to come back over to that page, and I'm going to talk to you about God's financial covenant at the end. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I'm going to do, you have, you don't have any outlines, but if you're at home and you're watching this, which I know you are, these are 10 keys to financial empowerment. Again, back in Ecclesiastes 10, 19, Solomon, the wisest man to live, said a feast is made for laughter and wine makes merry, but money answers all things. Now, the purpose of money is to solve problems. The purpose of money is to solve problems. Hmm? No, no, that's not the first key. This is just the introduction. I'll give you key number one. I'm just giving you the purpose of money is to solve problems. If your tooth hurts, it'll cost money to go to the dentist. If your car breaks down, it'll cost money to fix it. If you need to have your appendix removed, it's going to cost money. If you don't have money to take care of problems, you're in trouble. You can be as spiritual as you want to be. Well, God can heal me. Yes, he can. And I hope that he does, because if you don't have money, he better. If you don't have money, I hope he better. You say, well, you're, 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 you're knocking down my faith. No, it takes faith to believe God for money. It takes faith to believe God 
for the resources for you to do what God's called you to do. Now, there are three kinds of people who say they never think about money. There are three kinds of people who say, I never think about money. Number one is a liar. Number two is a fool. And number three is a parasite who lives off of others. A liar, a fool, and a parasite. Now, I'm going to give you 10 keys that will unlock the door to financial future for you. And key number one is you have to have a correct belief system. Anything you do in life, you have to have a correct belief system about. And money always follows a belief system. For instance, a gambler believes their next trip to Las Vegas is going to make them rich. Why would they get on a plane and fly there? Because they believe it's going to take place. Someone believes the lottery ticket holds their fortune. Somebody believes that working 60, 70 hours a week, a workaholic, that that will amass a fortune. And that's true unless they die first, grab their chest and fall over from a heart attack. Some believe they can keep doing what they've been doing and end up with a different result, and that's insanity. If you're following the wrong belief system, you've got to change and get the correct belief system. You say, what is the correct belief system? The Bible says in John 8, 32, you've got to know the truth. The truth will set you free. So you've got to know the truth about financial empowerment. You've got to know the truth about financial empowerment. You must believe God desires for you to live above the world's philosophy. You've got to believe that your belief system is different from the world's. You say, well, what's the world's philosophy? Get all you can, can all you get, and sit on the can. Mm -hmm. That's the world's philosophy. Get all you can, can all you get, sit on the can. You become an end all to things. But the philosophy of the biblical philosophy is if God can get it to you, he can get it through you. Mm -hmm. That you are just a person that God wants to flow through regarding finances. If God can trust you with 50, he can trust you with 100. If he can trust you with 100, he can trust you with 1,000. If he can trust to give you a, a, a motor scooter and you turn around and give it to somebody, you say, well, I, I thought this was for me, but you don't have any transportation and, and you need the motor scooter here, you take it. You see, God was just getting it to me so I could get it through me to give it to you. And once God finds out and figures out that you can work that way with him, you'll be amazed what he'll bring through you. You'll be absolutely amazed what he'll bring through you. So Romans 12, 2 says, don't be conformed to this world, the system, the thinking, the way the world does things, but you've got to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, Satan blinds the eyes of men by the world system. The world calls good evil and the world calls evil good. They're blinded. They're blinded by Satan. So you have to have a, number one, a right belief system. I wouldn't say belief system. Belief system. Number two, the second key is, the second key is you have to take personal responsibility. Hey, Tony Pearson, glad you're checking in with us. And Jessica Pearson, glad to have you with us. We're talking about 10 financial empowerment keys. Number one is have a correct belief system. We just covered that. And number two, take personal responsibility. My decisions determine my circumstances. Say that with me. My decisions determine circumstances. I'm not a victim. See, I'm not a victim. I'm not a victim. No one has made me do anything. No one's put a gun to my head. No one's making me do. I have made a decision. When you say I'm upset because this is what I'm making or this is what's going on, that's the decision you made. Your present is created by your past decisions. Where you are this moment is a result of past decisions. Basically, what you know is determining what you do. What you know is determining what you do. 
Have you, have you reached a point in life now where God's bringing wisdom to your life and you said, boy, I wish I knew that 10 years ago. I wish I'd just known that five years ago. Well, that's the regret of becoming wise. <laughs> the manifestation of wisdom is sorrow. <laughs> the more wise you get, the more sad you become. You don't get happy. You go, man, if I only knew that 20 years ago. So whoever you decide to trust is determining your future. Whoever you're listening to, whoever you've decided to trust is determining your future. Stop looking at where you've been and start looking at where you want to go. Start getting future focused. So key number two was take personal responsibility. Key number three is never accept the present as permanent. Never accept the present as permanent. Now, I want to say this to you, and I want you to hear this. Nothing sticks with you like lack. Mm. Nothing sticks with you like lack. Things can change. People can come. People can go. But you can find somebody you knew 20 years ago that was broke and you run into them now and they're still broke. Mm -hmm. living, living, just trying to make it, make it, make it. Always not quite there. Nothing sticks with you like lack. You can't correct what you're unwilling to confront. So you cannot accept the present as permanent. All significant change in finances requires faith. I want to say that again. All significant change in your financial world requires faith. You say, did you do that today? I've already done it like three or four times today. Three or four times where I, I know what has to happen right now between right this date and the end of the month so that I'm in a position for January 1. And I'm like going, okay, you know, we're believing God. But is my faith out there? Absolutely my faith is out there. Just a week ago, un, un completely out of the blue, someone that had visited our church one time when we were over at the, the little building at nine o'clock, guy and his girlfriend came, they got married, they moved to Wesley Chapel, and they sent the ministry a check for $500 out of the blue. Now, was I believing for that? Oh, I was believing for that and a lot more. But my, my, my ideal was not to fold my arms and say, well, this is as good as it gets. It's December. There's nothing coming in. I, I wasn't going to accept the present as permanent. I'm still believing God. I'm still believing God. I'm still believing God. Someone that sows a $200 seed into the ministry every month. So today we got a check for $400. Amen. I called them to thank him and they said, I'm so sorry. Starting January, I'm going to make sure that I sow significantly every month. And I said, man, you're hearing from God. You are, you are, you are hearing from the Lord. And so what's happening? I'm not accepting the present. Now that doesn't mean that everything's changing overnight. So let me give you some four keys to, to, to change out of the present. Number one, get a financial picture in your mind. The picture that stays in your mind comes to you in time. Get a picture in your mind. Get a picture in your mind. See a drawer with all the titles of your vehicles. You own the car. You're not financing it anymore. You've got the title. Do with it whatever you want to do. Angel, I think Elvis may need to take a walk there. Number two, never discuss your financial future. Never discuss your financial future with the unqualified. Never discuss your financial future with the unqualified. Don't invest the time with a relative or your brother-in-law or somebody who's sincere. Never invest your financial future. Never discuss your financial. I never discuss a problem with someone incapable of solving it. 
I think we're okay. I'm sorry. Never discuss your financial future with the unqualified. Number three, make a plan. Everyone say, make a plan. If I were you and you're watching this, we are now approaching the end of this year, and I would make a plan for the first quarter of the new year. January, February, March. This is where I want to be in March. This is where I want to be in March. When, when uh, April 1st shows up, this is what I want to accomplish in the first 90 days. And write that plan down. Make it plain. The Bible says write the vision down. Write it down and just, just write it down so that every day you can say, this is what I'm believing for. This is what's going to happen. Make a plan. And I have here execute in 60 days, but I'm giving you 90 days because we're in the holidays. Because mm -hmm. you're going to spend a lot of unnecessary money. By the way, regarding gifts... Really standardize your gift. Standardize your gift. Don't, it's the thought that counts. It's not the value of the gift. It's the thought that counts. You know, just being remembered that someone got a gift, you know, it's not how lavish it is. Um, I think we put ourselves in a wrong place trying to impress people uh, with gifts in the holidays. Um, kids will always have lots of stuff. Um, and they'll just find a couple things they like and the rest they'll leave. So uh, just just work on that. So never accept the present permit. Key number four, key number four. Hello, Lydia, nice to see you watching. We're talking about 10 keys to financial empowerment. We're talking about my book, Money Matters, and you see the course name on here. So let, let me give you a quick review. The first three keys, key number one was have a correct belief system. Key number two was take personal responsibility. Key number three was never accept the present as permanent. And key number four, everything in life is a test or a reward. Are you typing some of these in? No, because they can request them in advance. Okay, could you give me a bottle of water? Yes. Everything in life is a test or reward. Your rewards in life are determined by the kinds of problems you solve or that you're willing to solve. Everything in life is a test or a reward. If you will, if you will figure that out right now, this will save you a lot of agony. Everything in life is a test or reward. And the size of the problem determines the size of the reward. The size of the problem determines the size of the reward. Someone that collects garbage in a town not far from here, I know makes about $10 or ten fifty an hour. And they work for like five hours in the morning, six hours in the morning. Um, they work just a few days during the week. But can I tell you, they solve a problem. If you don't have your garbage picked up after a few weeks, you have rats and you have all kinds of disease and you have all kinds of problems. Um, the garbage workers in New York went on strike a few years ago and it was not a pretty sight. So they're solving a problem. But the lawyer that writes the letter for you gets paid $200 for writing a letter. That's the going rate for a lawyer to write a letter. Sometimes it's even more. You say, well... He's solving a problem, but one's making 200 and one's making $10 an hour. The size of the problem determines the size of the reward. So if you want to get a bigger reward, you got to start solving bigger problems. The people that you work for view you as a problem solver or a problem maker. If you become a problem maker, they're going to get rid of you. If you solve problems. Now, if you want to raise, here's what you do. You walk into your boss's office and you say, what is the biggest problem you have right now? I want to solve it. What's the biggest problem you have? I want to solve it. It may have something to do with the business. It may not. It may not. But you want to become a problem solver because everything in life is a test or reward. Before God promotes you, there will always be a test or a problem to solve. 
For Joseph, it was false imprisonment. For David, it was a person named Goliath. But both men were empowered financially. Joseph became number two in Egypt and David became the king of the nation. Never forget you'll be remembered for two things, the problems you solved and the problems you created. You'll only be remembered for two things. The problems, you, when the funeral comes, all of your friends will stand up and say, weren't they a great person? They went and got groceries for me when I couldn't get out. They shoveled my walk in the winter. They came when the hurricane came and put sandbags around my, they helped me. All of your friends will talk about all the problems. So then your family will get up. <laughs> then your family will get up and say, let me tell you about the time he tried to burn down the house, smoking out back. Remember when he stole dad's car and wrecked it? And, yeah. Uh -huh. You'll always be remembered for the problems you solved, the problems you created. Key number five, key number five, Isaac Bird, you're here. Good to see you. Key number five, we're talking about 10 financial empowerments. Stop wasting time. The, the key number five for financial empowerment, if you're writing down notes, is stop wasting time. The only difference between people is what they know. And the only distinction is how they use their time. The only difference between people is what they know and the only distinction is how they use, the, use their time. Time is more valuable than money. Let's all say that together. Time is more valuable than money. Go find a multi-zillionaire on his deathbed. He's not looking for more money. Right. He's looking for more time. Time is more valuable than money. You can lose money this year. Make a bad investment have to spend money you weren't planning on it. But if you work hard enough over the next couple of years, you can make that money back. But if you lose a year of your life in the hospital, you'll never get that year back. If you get held back a grade in school, you never get that year back. This is why debt is so bad. Because debt ties up your time. It's a financial liability extended over time. That's what debt is. A financial liability extended over time. You lose both time and money. Proverbs 22, seven says, the borrower is the servant to the lender. So you need to stop wasting time. Key number six, hearing is believing. Key number six, hearing is believing. Hello, Arlen Smith from Tennessee. We're talking about 10 financial empowerment keys. Glad you're watching with us. What you hear determines what you believe. What you hear determines what you believe. That's why you don't want to listen to doom and gloom. You do not want to listen to doom and gloom. You want to listen to good news. Proverbs 10, 22, the blessing of the Lord makes one rich and adds no sorrow to it. Proverbs 13, 22, a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. Psalm 35, 27, let the Lord be magnified who takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Deuteronomy 8 and 18, remember it's the Lord your God who gives you the power to get wealth. Hearing is believing. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. You want to keep hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing financial scriptures. Find all the, fi I have them highlighted in my Bible, all the financial scriptures. Someone says, well, you're just going to go out of the box about money. Well, I've been out of the box without money. Amen. You know, I, I felt like I was going to lose my mind because I didn't have finances. I thought I was going to get shut down, shut off, nowhere to live, no, nothing to do. So you must understand you've got to add faith to your financial believing and hearing 
is believing. Everybody say, hearing is believing. Hearing is believing. Someone says, well, I've been tithing, I've been giving. It's just not working out for me. Well, they asked Jesus the same question. In Mark chapter 10, verse 29, they said, Jesus, we've given up everything. We've given up houses and homes. We've left our wives. We're following you all over the Middle East here. And Jesus said, no man has left houses, Mark 10, 29, no man has left houses, brothers, sisters, father, mother, wife, or children, or lands for my sake or the gospels, who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time. So let me ask you a question. When you've complained about that, yes. When you've complained about that, did you claim the hundredfold blessing or did you just complain? Did you say... Just not working out for me. I tithe and um, da 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 da. Or did you claim the hundredfold blessing? Have I not said to the Lord, Lord, I've given up houses. I've done this. I've done this in your name. I declare a hundredfold blessing. My first house I ever bought at age twenty-one. My automobile setting in my garage cost more than the first house I bought at age 21. Now, don't tell me God hasn't blessed me. Look at where the Lord has brought me in the last 30 some years. I have believed God and I just keep walking in faith. You say, is this the last house? Well, we hope so, but I don't know. I don't know. Who knows? Who knows what God has in store? Don't tell my wife. She wants to stay here. But I, I'm, I'm telling you, you never know what the Lord's going to do. If you keep your faith up, keep believing God, keep believing. I've often wondered if they can land a helicopter in the back. That's been my biggest concern. My biggest concern. Or land a flying car. Is there enough room to, I might have to take some, I might have to take some more trees out. Just as long as it'll stop from the, the pool. All right. Number seven, key number seven. Key number seven, walk in integrity. Walk in integrity. If you're going to see financial empowerment, God does not bless liars, deceivers, crooked people. Well, Dr. Kreitz, I know crooked people that are getting rich left and right. Well, all you've got to do is do a little study of American history. All you have to do is study American history. And you'll find that some of these, some of these families that made tons of money many, many years ago wound up in great calamity. Their children... Uh, I could name names of political families and ancestors that made their money off of bootlegging and liquor, and their family is just scattered through history with calamity of assassination and death and all kinds of problems. You say, you actually believe that doing wrong brings a curse upon your life? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. And I believe that it doesn't just bring a curse for you. It could bring a curse for future generations. Mm -hmm. That's why you've got to walk in integrity. Honor your word. Honor your word. Integrity in key areas of time, relationships, and finances. If you promise somebody to do something and they do it and you've made an agreement, pay them what you owe them. I promise you, you trying to get out of it is only going to catch up with you. Mm -hmm. Key number eight, change what you say. Key number eight, start changing what you say. Everything God has ever created has ears. Trees have ears. Rocks have ears. Rocks have mouths. Jesus said, I can make the rocks cry out to me. And praise me. Everything created. He said, speak to the mountain and command it to go into the sea. 
Well, how can a mountain go into the sea if you command it if it can't hear you? So everything created hears you. So change what you say. Mark eleven twenty three. Write that scripture down and make that a part of your financial integrity. Mark eleven twenty three. Stay strong. Stay strong in that area. Change what you say. Don't say, man, we're not going to make it. We're going to run out of money before we run out a month. We don't have enough money to do this. Don't even tell your kids it's not an issue of finances. It's an issue of us discerning. Are we to do that now? Or are we to do that later? Do we need to do this now? Do we need to do that later? Don't get hung by your tongue. Don't say, well, bless God, we're going to do this. And then you get into a position that you backed yourself into a corner. Change what you say. You want the wisdom of God. Father, give me wisdom regarding my finances. I saved up funds for a project here and uh, we came through a, a difficult spot. So I took the funds and I began to start paying off things and paying off bills so I could eliminate things in the overhead. Praise the Lord. I'm still gonna get what I want, but now when I get it, I'm gonna be close to debt free. Hallelujah. I wanna get out of debt. I want to get out of debt. I want to be out of debt. Number key number nine, focus on finding empowering principles. Before you ask God to put more in your ship, make sure you fix your leaky boat. Go through and patch up the places. Find out what's sinking you. I have people come to me all the time and they say, I don't know why I don't have money. I said, bring in your checking account. Bring in your bank statement. And they show me their check card. I said, why are you using your check card to go to McDonald's? If you don't have enough money, don't go to McDonald's. Has it ever entered into your mind you don't have enough money to go to McDonald's? Don't put it on a check card because if you don't get it paid off, your $5 meal will soon become $8 or $9 or $10. Silly. Silly, silly little things. But it's never crossed our mind if we can't do it, not to do it. But you skip a meal every now and then, it'll remind you of being about the power of financial principles, about, the, about packing a lunch, about, about being empowered. But I don't believe you have to starve and I don't believe you have to you know, live, live on beans and rice. I believe you can believe God and I believe you can live good, but you've got to find, focus on what's sinking your ship. Go through your bank account and find out what's sinking your ship. I'm shocked how much we pay for cable and internet. I'm shocked how much we have a phone and cable. I'm shocked how much we pay. I, I, just, I just think it's, it's ungodly. I think it's ungodly how much people pay for cell phones. What's the new cell phone came out? They want $1,000 for the cell phone. And the people were lining up. They couldn't wait to get the new cell phone. It's just nonsense. It's nonsense. You know, the purpose of a cell phone is for you to be able to talk to somebody. <laughs> well, I know you want to text and you want to take pictures. But if the real reason you want a cell phone is to be able to talk to someone, you can remedy that for $39 at Walmart, 40 bucks at Walmart. Get yourself a little card. It's amazing what you can do when you begin to think. Think twice and to be the smartest one in your family. Focus on finding and power. And then key number 10, activate the faith of the seed in your life. Activate the faith of a seed in your life. A seed is what God will multiply. And your faith is why. Whenever you sow a seed, I sow a seed of kindness, you sow a seed of a meal, you sow a seed of an offering, you sow a seed of helping somebody, always wrap your faith around that seed. When you release what's in your hand, God will release what's in his. When you release what's in your hand, God will release what's in his. Always sow in faith. Always sow in faith. Sometimes you have to sow in obedience and then faith will come. 
Sometimes God will say, I want you to sow that amount. And you'll say, oh, uh, I don't feel God in this, but faith doesn't in a feeling. Faith isn't a feeling. You've got to be obedient. And once you obey God, then faith will come. But faith can go, faith can come. You've got to stay in faith. Some people sow their seed, they put it in the ground, they speak faith over it, it doesn't happen within two days, and they go with their mouth and start digging up their seed. I knew it wasn't going to work. I should have never done that. Look, we're going to be short this week. Well, you just canceled out with your, your mouth the faith that you were supposed to wrap around. God does not respond to need. He responds to faith. He does not respond to need. You don't think God doesn't know you have needs? You don't think everybody you meet on the street doesn't have a need? They all have a need. These people that come down on vacation, some of them have, I've met people who've saved up for years to come to St. Augustine. Saved up their whole life to go to Disney World one time. We look at them and think, boy, I wish I could be them. No, if you went back home, you may be glad you're who you are. But see, you're not living according to the world. You're living by faith. You're living by faith, which means I'm not moved by what I see. It means I'm not moved by what I hear. I am only moved by what I hear the word of God say, either through his written word, logos word, or his rhema word. All right, let's take a stop here and get any questions, and I'm going to come back, and I want to give you um, the three the three covenants. How are we doing with time? We have 10 more minutes. Yeah, well, we're low on battery, so I'm going to have to move quick. Any questions here in the in the room? Any questions here? Any questions online? Anybody watching online have a question? All right, go to your notes that I gave you originally on the other side of that page. Is there a thing about God's financial covenant? Is there a section that says God's financial covenant? Is it on that page? Okay. Is it all written out? It's not fill in the blank? It is fill in the blank. Let's, section five, section five on your notes. God's financial covenant, understanding the law of exchange. Everybody say the law of exchange. Law of exchange. In other words, when you exchange something in covenant with God, you give something to receive something. Someone says, well, I don't give to God to get something back. Really? When you work your job all week, you're working and you're not expecting a paycheck? That's silly to believe anything like that. Of course. Of course. Do you not do things for your children and, and when they don't respond correctly, you look at them and say, what's wrong with you? You should say thank you. You should say, love you, mommy. Love you, daddy. Thank you for doing that. It's called normal. It's called normal. There's always a response and a reaction. Always a response. So God is not any different. He has children. And he said in uh, the first uh, financial covenant is the tithe. Everybody say the tithe. tithe. The tithe is for returning. The tithe is for returning. It's holy. It's separated for a purpose. We're supposed to bring the tithe, the Bible says, into the storehouse. What in the world is the storehouse? Well, it says so there will be meat. Well, what does that mean? All right, let me break it down to you in modern day vernacular. If I need something, I go to the store. I exchange money and they give me something. If I need meat to grill for the dinner, if I need vegetables, I give them money. They put my items in the store. There is an exchange. When you go to God's house, you're supposed to be receiving the meat of the word. You're supposed to be being built up. So you bring your tithe, and I'm going to even take this further not just to a place, but to a person. And I'm going to tell you why I get this. Because in the old covenant, they brought their tithe to the priest, and then the priest turned around and tithed up to the chief priest. I believe that you, wherever you're being fed is where you need to tithe. 
bottom line. I have, I, I'm not going to tell you that, uh, you know, you can go to some dead old religious church and you're not getting fed and you're not being strengthened and you're supposed to be giving, you know, pulling your money over week after week and thinking something's happening. That's not an exchange. That's a tax. <laughs> that's a religious tax. There's a big difference. You want to sow your tithe. And someone says, well, is a tithe a debt I owe? No, it's a seed you sow. It's a seed you sow. It's a seed you sow. Now, the tithe is for returning, and the seed or the offering is for replanting. You return 10% back to God, one dime out of every dollar, is the tithe, but your seed, and there's a difference between your tithe and your offering, your offering is for replanting. Offerings, offerings. Now there's three kinds of offerings. I want to talk to you about those. Number one is need. Everyone say need. N-E-E-D, need. We find out in our church body, someone has a need, we receive an offering. We know we have a church over in some part of the third world. There was a hurricane. They have a need. We take up an offering. We respond to needs. Number two is deed, D-E-E-D, deed. This kind of offering is where you, you do something bigger. You find partners. You find people to sponsor things. You want to do a good deed. You want to build a pregnancy center. You want to, you want to build a home for unwed mothers. That's a big deed. So there's need, there's deed, and then the third type of offering is seed. Everyone say seed. 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 The seed is what God multiplies where you can't buy a miracle, but you sow a seed. You can't buy a miracle, but you sow a seed. Your seed has to be unlocked by your faith. That's why on my offering envelopes, if you're a pastor or leader, I put, sow your very best seed. I don't give it an amount. I just say, sow your very best seed. Someone's very best seed that day might be $10. Someone's very best seed that day might be $10,000. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not the, I'm not the, I'm not the decision maker on that. I'm not the decision maker on that. So there's three kinds of offerings, need, deed, and seed. There's two types of giving, tithe and offering. And then the third type of giving, it's not in your notes, is alms. Everyone say alms. Alms, alms is benevolence. It's giving to hurting people, poor people. You're driving down the road, you come to an intersection. There's a man holding a sign says, I need money. The Holy Spirit says, give him a dollar. You did, that's called alms. You don't give your tithe money as an om. You don't give your tithe money to a family member who's broke. You return the tithe back to your storehouse where you're being fed. Why is that? Because you want to continually be fed. You've got to take care of the storehouse. You've got to keep the lights on. You've got to keep the, the, the teacher fed. The Bible says if a teacher teaches the word and gives you spiritual things, you're supposed to return material things to him. God is not mocked. Whatever man sows, that's what he's going to reap. All right. Any questions? Any questions? Any comments tonight on what we're doing? Simon is watching from India. Simon's watching from India. Hello, Simon. He's written down need, deed, and seed. Very good, Simon. Very good. Simon, I love preaching here and you watching in India. I really, I cannot tell you what a blessing this is to know that my teachings are going on in India. You teach everything I, everything you hear come out of my mouth, man, you teach it. And after you teach it the second time, first time you can say, Dr. Kreitz said, and the second time you can say, I heard. And the third time say, the Lord told me. There you go. And then you're in good shape, Simon. Any questions? We're down to two minutes. Is that what your signal was? Now one minute. One minute? All right. Those of you that are watching, um, this has been a teaching with New Covenant University. 
There'll be another one coming along here in a little while. Make sure that you sign in when you watch the, uh, the video so we know what your degree is, as many people have that have uh, checked in tonight. And if you want more information, go to ncu.education, ncu.education. Doesn't matter where you're at in the world, you can see right here, right now, you can get an education. You can get a degree. And we hold a, a couple graduations a year, one here in the United States. We have one in the Bahamas. We may wind up going to two here in the United States. But whatever we can do, we want to help you. All right? God bless you, and we are going to finish.